Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Q&A webinar for 101 Mixing Tricks, a January version. First of all, whoever's on the webinar, let me know where you're from. We have a lot to do today. There's a lot of questions. And I also want to take your questions as well. So I hope you have a lot of them. Um, we haven't done this for a couple of months. Usually, I like to do this every month, but the holiday got in the way. So I figured it would be better if we just waited for the beginning of the year. And I stored up a whole lot of questions. Unfortunately, I can't get to all of them that were sent to me. Today, I'm just going to post the ones or answer the ones that came to me directly via email. All of the others you can see because they're comments on the 101 Mixing Tricks individual modules or individual individual uh, tricks. So whenever someone posts a question there, I try to answer it as quickly as possible, and you can see those answers there as well. But uh, again, if someone sends me something, I want everyone to be the benefit of that question and answer, so this is where I usually post them. So once again, everybody, if you can hear me, let me know. And also, tell me where you're from. Anders from Sweden. Hello, Anders. Glad you're here. As you know, in the past, I've scheduled these webinars later in the day. I'm in Southern California. I'm in Los Angeles. So I scheduled it for 4 p.m. Los Angeles time, which was way too late for others that are in different parts of the world. So that's why we've actually moved everything up to the morning. And I think that works better for everyone. Uh, hello, Johnny from Detroit. Itzhak from L.A. Richard from Atlanta. Very cool. And we'll get started in a minute here. Let's see who else is on. Greg from Atlanta as well. Joe from Indiana. Well, welcome, Joe. First time here. And I'm glad you could make it with us. We had a lot of people sign up for this. Generally speaking, then I... I have to admit, sometimes I'm disappointed with the number of people that actually sign up for, for the Q&A and the turnout. But this time it looks like it's really good, so it's good for everybody. Victor from Chicago. Hello, Victor. And who else do we have? Pretty good crowd here. One of the things that I want to ask you all is if there are any mixing tricks that you would like to see or are there any style of tricks that you'd like to see and a little bit later i'm going to share with you a short poll that you could tell me what it is or you, you can actually tell me right here in, in the chat as well so that's cool so let's get started so let's go to the very first question this is from norman what are the most common track naming conventions that you've seen in the box? And how about color conventions? What about order of tracks and typical buses in your DAW? Well, I haven't seen anything common. Everybody does it a different way. I wish there was one convention, but there really isn't. I can tell you what I like, though, Norman. Uh, I If I get tracks into mix, I want them to be as descriptive as possible. So one of the things I generally hate is when I get tracks in that say uh, Jim, Tom, Bob, and it doesn't tell me what that is. So it would help if I just say uh, rhythm guitar, lead guitar, lead guitar one, lead guitar two, things like that. So the more descriptive you could be, the better. I want to show you actually a sample. This is something really short that um, that I did. And this is from a video, actually. This isn't a live Pro Tools session. But what I want to show you is 
right in here, take notice. This is some of the things that I do. I try to be as descriptive as possible, as you can see here. But whenever there's a subgroup, like in this case, a drum subgroup, I usually capitalize it. So that tells me it's a, a subgroup. And over here, here's a bass subgroup. So I'll capitalize it. Rhythm section, again, is capitalized. So that's one of the tricks that I use that seems to work well. But again, just take, you know, everything, take a look. Everything is fairly well laid out. And that really helps. It helps you as a mixer and it helps someone else if they're really mixing. So that's the, probably the best thing I can tell you. Um, let me just go back here for a second. Okay. How about color track conventions? No, I haven't seen any. Every it, That's a you know a very personal thing what about the order of tracks and typical buses in your dop um i've seen order of tracks all over the place and again it really depends on what you're comfortable with but if i had to make a guess and if i and really what i've seen is always the drums to the left starting with the bass or i'm sorry i'm sorry starting with the the kick drum and kick snare hat and then toms and then uh overheads um and room mics and bass would be after that and then guitars keyboards vocals if and i think that's kind of typical but again i've seen it way other ways where people put the vocal all the way on the left and then the lead vocal because that was the one the thing they wanted to focus on the most most so uh, at the end, Norman says, I have my own style already. I'd like to make sure I'm working similar to most studios. Well, if you have your own style, you should keep that because there's really not, uh, <laughs> there's not a convention. There's not one way to do it. Okay, Mikhail. Uh, list of extremely popular songs with deconstructed bad mixes. Oh, okay. Um, this was a long email, as I remember, and there were five or six points, and these are some of the things that he wanted to see. And here's uh, one of them. He wanted to see a list of popular songs that were bad mixes, illustrating their emotion performance by the musician and cultural context in which the lyrics were written may have more influence than the mix itself. Um, and he says, at the end, one that immediately comes to mind is lack of bass guitar and overcompression at the low end on the guitars, Metallica's Black Album. Well, here's the deal. It's very difficult to single out a bad mix. And there's a couple reasons. First of all, mixing is so personal that a lot of times what I think is bad might sound brilliant to you. And especially if it's a hit. If it's a hit, people tend to go, wow. That snare drum is really hot, but that's what really made the song. <laughs> so it's hard to say exactly, you know, what would constitute a bad mix. Usually if something is really bad, it doesn't make it to the end. It doesn't make it on the air. And people will keep on remixing, especially the bigger artists. I mean, it's nothing for an artist to do a mix 30, 40 times. The, the famous story is Michael Jackson's Billie Jean. They mixed it 99 times and used mix number two. So that happens a lot where there'll be a lot of mixes and, and you'll do as many as you feel as possible. I, I've heard of you two keeping a mix up on the console for six weeks until they were happy with one of the mixes. So generally speaking, you won't find bad mixes becoming hits or what we call bad mixes. Back in the old days when... Everything was done really fast. I'm talking the 50s and 60s when things are done very quickly. There was more what you'd call bad mixes in that sometimes there were things that were way out of whack balance-wise. But again, we listen back to those and, and kind of like them. <laughs> you know, you listen to something so much, you, you it becomes part of you. So uh, who's to say what a good and bad mix is? Uh, so I'm sorry, I can't really uh, come up with, you know, bad mixes. Uh, they're, <laughs> if it's a hit, it usually isn't a bad mix. Um, let's go to the next one here. From Charles, what would be your recommendations for studio open back mixing headphones? Assuming that a lar large proportion of your time mixing had to be allocated to use of said headphones. 
I, I can't tell you because I don't use open backed mixing headphones. Um, open back phones were popular in the studio for <laughs> half a second. And mostly the AKGs that I remember, they were 140s, 240s, things like that. And they were they were big for a little bit and kind of fallen out of favor. We all kind of liked the isolation that we get from the closed back. So that's what you see most of the time. For mixing, the, the open back might actually be better. I agree that they might work better. You can kind of hear everything else around you. But the only phones that I like that I kind of trust is what I'm wearing right now and their Audio Technica M50s, MX50s, I think, which are great. ATM 50s, that's what it is. And the, those are wonderful. So, uh, you know, I recommend them. I don't endorse them or anything, but I recommend them. And uh, I've had good luck with them. I wouldn't mix with them, but I do check, you know, occasionally on, on headphones. And especially if you're listening to things that you might not hear in real speakers for clicks, pops, things like that, they really work well. Okay, let's see what the next one is. Stan has two questions. When doubling the lead vocals, for instance, an octave lower and also putting lead vocals on two or more separate tracks, for pitch correction trick, would you say it's best to use all the effects that you're using on lead vocals, on, on those background vocal channels as well? I don't think there's a rule of thumb on this, Stan. The way it kind of works is, now, for instance, if you're doing a double, you might want to put the same effects on. Sometimes if you don't, so, sometimes if you use a, a different effect, that makes it kind of unique sounding on a double. I'm just talking about a double now. And sometimes if, you're, if you use a, not only a different effect, but it's dry, that can push the, the vocal up front in the mix, and that can sound good too. So I hate to say it really depends, but it really does depend. I think what you'll find when, if it's the same vocalist that's harmonizing with him or herself, where you have the lead vocal and then maybe two harmony vocals coming in, usually it's kind of the same, the same effects that you'll use. If it's a very distinct background vocal, then they'll usually get something different. But that's usually, but... You know, again, however it works in your mix is the way it works. It sounds like a cop-out. I'm sorry, but, you know, each mix is unique. Each mix is different. So what I can tell you is the norm, as usual, might not work in your next mix. So, again, you have to keep an open mind on that. Okay, Stan's second question. When reamping keyboards, you were saying that they're being played through outboard gear like guitar amp recorded with the room mic as a mono signal. Could be mono, could be stereo. Now, once I've recorded the reamp keyboard sound and put it on its own track, do I add it into the original software keyboard by pushing the fader up? If so, is there a rule of thumb how much to add? Yes. Oh, well, is there a rule of thumb? Uh, I, I'd have to say, yes, there's a starting point. And it's the same with a lot of different things like under snare mics, for instance, or using a sub kick mic, kind of the same thing. You bring it up to where you just about can hear it, just about the point that you hear it. A lot of times that becomes, that's enough. And you find with effects, that's the same thing as well. Just about the time you can hear it, it's enough. So that's a good rule of thumb to go by where bring it up to where you can just barely hear it. See if that works. See if that makes a difference. Because sometimes just that little amount pushes it over the edge, especially if the rest of the mix is fine-tuned. Now, in this case, if you're reamping a keyboard, the reason why you're reamping it is you're trying to make it sound come alive, sound different, and, and, and just be bigger. So if that's the case, sometimes the, the more you hear of that reamp track, the better, because it's a different 
more lively sound and it might fit better in the mix. So, you know, that's a way to look at it. You're trying to make that sound different. You're trying to, instead of putting artificial liveliness and artificial reverb or something on it to make it sound live, you're doing it kind of a brute, brute force method by using, you know, uh, you're reamping it. You're using an amplifier and then you're miking that to get the first reflections primarily. That, that's really what it is, the first reflection of the room. So, he, Bring it up to just about where you can hear it. See if it makes a difference. If not, flip it around and try mostly the reamped sound and see how that fits in the track. Okay, let's go to the next one. And I see there's a lot of questions here, and I'm going to get to them in a second. So hang on. From Marcus, I'm not sure how to record vocals, doubles, and backings. If I have only one singer, what's a common thing? Let her him or her sing the same parts at different distances to the mic or let them sing harmonies like the third or fifth. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. You're not sure how to record a lot of vocals with one singer. And this is tricky because sometimes one singer with the same microphone can start to sound a little funny. So here's the first thing. Uh, the first trick that you can do whenever you add a, a second a second track from the same singer doesn't matter if it's a harmony doesn't matter if it's a double whatever it is what you want to do is just have them take a step back from the microphone and you give it a little bit more air so that will give it a different sound it will fit better in the mix so that's the first thing. So every time you do another track, have them take a step back from the microphone. And that will just give it a different sound and make it a little bit thicker and a little bit bigger. So you won't have to do anything in the mix. You've already done it. The other thing that you can do is change the microphone. Just add a different microphone. And that will change the sound as well. Um, and you, you could even change you know, the whole signal path, the microphone, the preamp, the whole thing. And once again, what you're trying to do is just make it sound a little different, a little thicker, so you won't have to do that in the mix. And that's kind of the best way to do that. There's some good tricks for you. Okay, next one. From Nathan. One thing that wasn't clear is tracking at these high numbers, such as 96K or higher, 90 for 192K. Are you guys still mixing in that, that high of a resolution, or do you reduce it down to 44.1? save drive space and not tax the CPU power. Well, first of all, take the last part of the question. No, it doesn't get reduced down. Uh, even when you mix, you don't. You, if you're recording at 96K, 96K, you keep the mix at 96K and the same at 192 or 384 or whatever it is that you're doing. You keep it at that resolution. You let the mastering engineer change the resolution to something less. So the mixer doesn't even worry about that. Uh, as far as drive space, you don't worry about that anymore because we got plenty and it's cheap. As far as taxing the CPU power, it's the same thing. Almost all computers have lots of power. At 192K, sometimes that's a problem. And certainly it is a 384, but at 96K, just about every DAW and every computer can handle sessions with high track counts with not a problem. So yes, uh, we, you know, for the most part, everybody I know is at 96K. Everybody would like to go higher if they could and, and do occasionally. And we keep it there all the time. We then mix it to that, that resolution and then send it out to mastering. And mastering changes if it's going to go to CD or um, uh, DVD, CD or DVD, they change it to uh, 44.1 or 48K as required. If you're doing the mastering, then when you master, that's when you change the resolution. Okay, I hope I answered that one, Nathan. From Marcus, drum kits normally sound bad in my opinion, don't they? Don't you always have to EQ them after recording? Or are the drum kits which sound nearly as you wouldn't need to EQ them? They sound so good that you wouldn't need to EQ them. Okay, Marcus, yes, uh, to both of those things. 
Here's the way it works. When you're working with the pro drummer, the drums sound great automatically. Um, there's two parts to this. The first part is the um, the first part is the drums themselves. They have to be tuned well. New heads help a lot, but if they're tuned really well, then they're going to sound good right off. So they won't need a lot of EQ. And the second thing is the drummer. If you get a great drummer on a bad kit, it will still sound really good. If you get a mediocre drummer on a great sounding kit, it will usually sound pretty good, but it won't sound great. Now, as far as EQ, yeah, um, you know, again, as you go down the food chain and you get, a, the drummers get worse, the more you end up EQing things, it seems. Because, uh, you know, again, it's the player. The player makes such a difference in all of this, and it's always overlooked, and we think it has something to do with, you know, what kind of EQ we're using or whatever. But really, if you get great players, it automatically sounds really good. And you'll find you just have to do a lot less. Uh, as far as EQing, let's just say you, you got an A-list drummer. You got a Steve Ferroni or, or a Brian McLeod or somebody like that. And they came in, the drums sound great, they play great. You might end up doing some EQing at the end. And that's only to make everything fit better in the mix. You're not generally trying to make the drums sound good because they sound good already you're trying to make everything fit better so that's where you're eqing so you know again this thing of hitting the, the snare drum and going oh okay i gotta make this sound better that doesn't happen so much you, you don't have to do that you put all of your mix together and you go okay yeah i have to brighten the snare to make it jump out or i don't hear the thump on the kick so i have to add something because the bass is covering up or, or whatever. So that's what ends up happening more than, try, you know, um, EQing to make them sound good. Okay, from Phil. How can you tell that a particular vocal or bass includes room resonances? Specifically, I'd like to be shown how to capture an analysis of a track and how to identify where the resonances, resonances are visually. I've read examples where the engineer said, you made a notch at 127 hertz to get rid of some problem low end. I want to know how they identified it and came up with a very specific conclusion of 127. Similarly, how do you tell by looking when two... Well, okay, let, let me talk about the first one first. Well, you know, it doesn't happen all that much where someone goes in and says, I hear a problem at 67 cycles. <laughs> it, it really doesn't happen that much. Unless, of course, you go into a room that you don't know, you walk around, you clap your hands, and you hear a boing or something. Or uh, you just hear the room overload at a certain frequency. And most engineers know where that frequency is. They, they won't know it's 127 cycles, for instance, but they'll know it's in that particular range. And they'll just take uh, an EQ, uh, you know, a graphic, or they'll take a, um, a parametric, and they'll dial around until they get it in that neighborhood and, and, and then find it and go, oh, okay, it sounds better. I get rid of the boing or the sound that I want. There are some engineers that will activate the room one way or another and will look at a, a real-time analyzer and just look for a peak there and find it. Now, of course, it's you can only find... You know, the resolution of your analyzer means a lot. So if you don't have, if you have a, a one octave analyzer, you're not going to see very much. If you have a third octave, you'll see more and a sixth octave even more. But, you know, again, it all depends on the room you're in. Most rooms don't have that problem. Sometimes it's only in one place in a room where you have the problem. So it just so happens where you have to set the drums up in a certain area and there's a boing there, there's a you know, room overload or something that the engineer didn't like. Chances are that even if the engineer didn't make that, that notch or whatever, it might have not been noticed by anybody. So, you know, again, it, it's a taste thing here. But, you know, that's kind of how it's done. I'd say the majority of... When that's done, it's done by ear, and when it's not done by ear, it's using a real-time analyzer to kind of figure that out. 
And similarly, how can you tell, second part of the question, how can you tell by looking when two frequencies are fighting each other from different instruments? How can you detect it and correct it in the mix? Well, that's done by ear. I mean, you solo up, you know, two different tracks, and this is what you're doing when you're mixing anyway. And you should be doing this. You should be soloing up two different tracks that are kind of in the same frequency range and listening to hear if they're covering one one another up. If you can hear all of the notes from you know one track to another, if they're both distinct, and if they're not, that usually means that there's a frequency somewhere that's that's clashing. So you'll kind of dial that up, and and on one you'll peak it, and one you'll boost it, and the other you'll cut it, or sometimes you'll just cut it on on one track, and and that will get rid of it. Uh, another thing is, you know, you just look at your equalizers sometimes, and that will tell you if you have a bunch of things that are EQ'd at exactly the same frequency, chances are you're going to have a problem with that frequency. So how do you get around it? Well, just move the frequency a little bit. <laughs> if it's at 2.3 K, move it to 2.2 or 2.4 and chances are you won't have the problem anymore. Or so that's the easy way. And the other way is if you have two uh, frequencies, two two tracks that are boosted at 2.4 K, for instance, then dip one at 2.4 and boost it at another place. So those are the way it, the way it works, Phil. Generally speaking. Okay, next one from Gavin. One thing I feel that should have been covered in the video series is vocal automation. I feel that this is such an important element in the mixing process these days. I've always wondered how I can do the syllable by syllable automation. You always hear in professional mixers top 40 hits on the radio. I've also heard that some mixers also automate their sins too, like vocal reverb and delay perhaps. Well, okay, this is actually covered in module one, a lot of this anyway. So uh, for instance, um, you know, uh, the things on, th there are tricks for vocal reverb and delay, so you can just check that. But as far as vocal automation, that's strictly done by ear and feel. Here's the thing about automation. You can't put it in too soon. And many times that's one of the problems that mixers have that aren't experienced, where you start to automate things too soon in the mix. Usually mix the automation happens as the very last thing. You get everything together and you're so happy with it. You're, you love the mix and then you're going to tweak it. That's when you go in and you automate it. This is right towards the very end. So with the vocal, you'd go in and you write it so you can hear every syllable, every word. So you're just listening to the mix and you're writing that vocal. <clears throat> you throw it into automation and you write it through the whole mix. Or sometimes you just put it into touch automation and you just touch it at certain places in the mix where you can't hear something or you need to boost it. And... Uh, or if it really needs a jump a few dB, you might go in, you might draw it in in the automation. But that's the very last thing that you do. So maybe I should go in and, and do a trick that goes over that a little bit more in detail. Thanks, Gavin, for that. And let me see what I can do. We're getting down to the last ones. I'm, I know you guys have a lot of questions. I'm going to get to them in a little bit. Here's from Greg. In Pro Tools, what's the difference in outcome between creating a print track within a session from a mix bus rather than going through the bounce to disk process? Okay, they're basically the same thing. Uh, and you're trying to accomplish the same thing. What it is, is you want to make sure that you have compression, EQ, effects on a track, and you want to print it. Okay, there's two ways to do it. One way is to just export it, just uh, play it through. So what you're doing is you're sending it out a bus for a print track. You're sending it out of a bus. You're recording it onto another track, and you're doing it live in real time. The bounce is you're just going and you're saying, I want to bounce this particular track, make it a new track, and then import it. So the same thing is being accomplished. accomplished. It's just some people like doing it one way. Some people like doing it the other way. And now Pro Tools and the latest versions have 
has all sorts of new ways to do that, track freeze being one, where now you can freeze all that and get all of your resources back, your CPU resources, and you just use track freeze. So that's another way to do it. So it's just your preference. Number two, he says, is any sound of quality loss when rendering through Audio Suite, rendering a plug into the actual WAV file within a track? Yeah, sometimes, because sometimes you might find that a, um, a plug-in doesn't have the resolution you want. And I'll give you an example. Sometimes you have a 96K track, for instance, and I'll 96K sample rate. But the plugin won't go to 96K, even though it's showing up in your session. So what it's doing is dithering it down to 48K or 56K or something, and the rest is just zeros. It's adding, it doesn't add noise. It just adds nothing, basically. It makes the track, the size of the track larger. So, yeah, sometimes it happens. I wouldn't worry about it. If it sounds good to you, just do it. <laughs> you know, really, it, it doesn't make a huge difference if you like the way it sounds then do it a lot of times there is no sonic quality lost and i'd say in the majority of plugins that's the case but some there is so um you know just be aware number three why do most pro engineers use 96k sampling rate or higher over 48 or 44.1 well it's higher resolution um in some cases it sounds a lot better in some cases it doesn't but the fact of the matter is you have a lot more. Uh, let's look at it like this. Think of, of one sample, and you're cutting it into 48,000. You're cutting it into 48 pieces. And you have another sample, same thing. You're, court, you're cutting it into 96 pieces. Well, the one that has the more pieces is more precise because you can go in there and you can look with, at a greater precision at the one piece. So the other way to look at it is the higher the sample rate, the closer you are getting to analog. The more samples you have, the closer it is to analog because analog is infinite samples. So that's a couple of ways to look at it. And that's why everybody's doing 96K. It's, it's, it's better. It sounds better for the most part. And let's see. I think this is the last one here, and we get to your questions. From Travis, how do bands from the 70s get that layered effect but only on one track. Example, Ozzy, Steve Miller, I think some Eagles. Um, I know stuff like Beatles, Strawberry Fields are claiming reel-to-reel -reel effect. Mm, cool vocals like that. Okay, yeah. So here's the way it worked back in the 70s. You didn't have a lot of effects. You had two. You had a tape machine that you used for delay. There were no digital delays at the time. Towards the end of the 70s and early 80s, you saw digital delays. But back then, you just had tape delay. That's it. And you had a reverb. And the reverb was usually a plate reverb, a real plate. Sometimes it was an acoustic chamber. That was it. That's all you had. And most studios only had those two things. That was it. The, the reverb was frequently pre-delayed and that was using a separate two-track tape machine to do that. So you had a delay that was anywhere between, eh, generally speaking, I'd say it's about 100 milliseconds, 110, 120 millisecond delay, pre-delay into the plate reverb. And you had this other digital reverb, or this um, uh, tape delay that you used. And the tape, because you only really had a few speeds, was anywhere between 175 and 375 milliseconds, some, something like that. That's the sound. That's what you had. And you were just using combinations of those, those two things, combinations of a real tape machine, tape delay, and combinations of a real reverb, a real plate reverb using a tape delay, pre-delay. That was the sound. That That's it. Now, what ends up happening is... Our processing sounds it doesn't sound like that. It doesn't sound as smooth because it's digital these days. And back then, don't forget, everything was rolled off. There wasn't a lot of high end on anything. So those tape machines were using old reels of tape. And if they went to 6K, it was lucky. So again, you weren't 
there wasn't a lot of high end and all that stuff. So that's the sound that you heard of the 70s, the 60s and 70s. Everything sounds dull. All those effects are dull and there's not many of them. That's it. So if you want to reproduce that, that's what you do. Okay. Now we get to the live Q&A. Okay, for everybody that wrote something in. I'm going to go to Richard first. Any ideas of removing a vocal? Back in the 70s and 80s, there was an analog box from a guy in Georgia that would do it, looking for a DAWA. Um, yeah, okay, here's the best way to do it. When you get a stereo track and you have to split it, so in other words, you have to have the left track left track on a different track from the right one because you have to be able to manip manipulate it separately. Here's what you do. You flip the phase of one of the tracks. It doesn't matter what it is. And suddenly what you're going to find is everything that's in the center is going to disappear. That's how it's done. The, I mean, it, there are other ways to do it. If, if Here's maybe a better way. Okay, duplicate that stereo track, flip the phase on it, and gradually bring it in against the regular stereo track that you have, and you'll find some things that will jump out and some things that won't. So um, you're trying to remove a vocal. Let's see. Okay, well, I'm telling you the wrong thing. I'm sorry. What I'm telling you is how, how to isolate that center track rather than remove it. But it's, it's the same idea. Okay, here's what you do. Get an MS processor. And the MS processor, it doesn't matter what it is, you You'll in that MS processor, you should be able to isolate or you should be able to get rid of the center track because most of them have the facility to be able to do that. All it is is phase. It's um, flipping the phase on something to get rid of, of everything in the middle. From Johnny, what's the best way to get your recordings to sound studio or radio quality? Can it be done without sending to master? Yeah, oh, sure. It, mastering generally helps because what they'll do is they'll compress it more. And the uh, radio ready is a sound of compression. Compression is the most difficult thing to get your arms around because it's how much should you add when you sh when should you add it and when does it sound good and when does it sound bad so that's one of the most difficult things to get your arms around the when you go back and you listen to again 60s 70s stuff things were compressed a lot even though they didn't have a lot of compressors they always compress things when recording always and sometimes it was a lot and again, you compress things when you're mixing. Sometimes not as much, but you did compress it. And then you compress it again during mastering because you have to, in order to get it on a piece of vinyl, you have to do less of it for CD. But nonetheless, um, there's a lot of compression that you're hearing. And, and that's basically what Radio Ready is. So all I can say is... Um, Get your compression chops together. Learning how to add a lot of compression without hearing it is a pretty good, a pretty good um, thing to learn and know how to do. And uh, let me tell you, a lot of it has to do with the attack and release controls. That will definitely, that's the definite key to it. Okay, from Victor, um, I use the ATM M45 headphones, but not to listen to music. I use the fine tune with pan location and 3D depth. Yeah, sure. And that's a great way to do it. And I do the same thing occasionally, I have to say. Johnny, follow up. Should high, mid, low frequencies be at certain levels of frequencies? No. Um, again, every mix is different, every mix is unique. You can look at an EQ curve with the real-time analyzer, and you can get a feel for what certain songs sound like, look like on the RTA, and you can go for that. But it's never exactly, every song is different. I mean, you could dial that particular, those frequencies in, but it won't matter. 
because what works on one song won't work on another. It will get you in the ballpark. Don't get me wrong. It'll get you in the ballpark, but it won't necessarily get you. Um, it won't be something you can dial in every day. So, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, there, there's no real way. I, I, low end, I, I would look at the low end more than the high end, for instance, when it comes to an RTA. And um, Joe Ciccarelli, great engineer, great friend, um, producer, he's done that for 25 years. As long as I've known him, he's had an RTA that he's always had in the studio and he still does it. I asked him about it, you know, about a month ago. He still used that. He says, oh yeah, I use it to get my low end, dial in my low end. So it's definitely worth it. From Itzhak, can you demonstrate how to use the waved ADT? Do you like it? I haven't used it. So no, I can't, but I'll look into it. Um, I, I'll look into it and uh, I'll get it and and I'll I'll do that for you. Okay, from Charles, my only viable vocal recording space is four by two closet. Wow. Anything to account during tracking? Uh, anything to default? Think about. Well, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, the one thing in, in a small space reflections are really bad so if nothing else i would keep the 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 wall that the mic is looking at so in other words the vocalist the back of their head that wall keep that as soft as you can and keep the side walls soft and that should work that should sound a lot better because reflections are not your friend in this case. And you may have to even um, do the front wall. So the one behind the mic, and that would be the best way to do it. From Richard, any thoughts on using 88.2 versus 96? Uh, 96, don't worry about dithering anymore. 88.2 is, I don't know anybody that does it. When you were, when CDs were a big deal, the, there was some thought it would make it easier in the long run. I don't think anyone's ever heard the difference, you know, between the dither between 96 and 88 too, uh, on most things, uh, on the odd audio file thing, perhaps, but generally speaking, no, just use 96 and be done with it. Uh, from Joe, I was wondering if you could explain how radio station compressors work. Are they software or hardware? What effect do they have on the songs we hear? Well, a lot. Um, they're limiters there's compressors and limiters but here's the way it works um by the way every radio station especially a radio station with a um pop music you know I, i'm going to take this off just for a second so you can hear me see me it's a little better there we go here's the way it works on a radio station there's usually a signal chain and on a like top 40 station they're very careful about not letting anybody know what that signal chain is because they want it to be as loud as possible the problem is if you're a 50,000 watt station you cannot be 50,000.1 watts you have to be 50,000 and not a, a milliwatt more otherwise the FCC can pull your license so they have these really hard limiters that will will stop the modulation from happening and they go right up to 50 watts or 500 watts or a thousand watts or 10,000 whatever it might be they take it right up as far as it will go and not a milliwatt past that so that has an effect on the sound there's usually also a compressor before that because they they want to get the sound as loud as possible because again it's the same old thing the louder your radio station is the more people like it and there's lots of of tests that actually bear this out so as a result you, you know you have this signal chain and it's the same signal chain that we use in the studio we're you know we're using a and especially uh you'll find mastering engineers compressor limiter at the end the, the limiter keeps it from overloading the compressor raises the relative level and that's what we're trying to do all the time so how does this affect what we're hearing well it affects it because 
everything's getting recompressed and relimited. And that's why what you hear on radio might sound different than what you heard everywhere else. Because, you know, again, it's going through a whole other signal chain. Back in the 70s and 80s, some large studios used to actually have a small transmitter, radio transmitter, on the lot. Like a and I can remember, had that. With the car out back. And you would be able to hear what your song actually sounded like over the radio by transmitting it and listening to a version of a signal path. Uh, although, again, it's different for every big radio station. So, yeah, it really does affect what you hear on the radio, definitely. And that's why sometimes by compressing something too much, it sounds worse on the radio than it should. And you'll find things that are compressed less actually just jump out more on the radio and will sound a lot better. Okay, from Randall. I'm just getting into this and love your program. What was your concept of how to get the most from your program? I'm overwhelmed by all the options. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, and what I find is most people don't get through all of the tricks. What they'll do is they'll focus on a few that they think that can help them for the next mix. And, and that's cool. That works just fine. What I would recommend is at least go try to go through them all and look at a little bit to see, because you'll be surprised. There may be something that's focusing on a keyboard, for instance, but you'll find that it will work really well on something else and work on a vocal or vice versa. There are many of the tricks We'll just work on a lot of different things. So that's why it's worth kind of li listening to s at least a little bit of each one. One of the things I definitely do is download the, the checklist, though. Look at the checklist, and that will give you a good idea of... There's one for each module, for each trick, and that will give you a good idea how each one works. And uh, it's worth it to have it during a mix. Just print it out or keep it on an iPad or something or your phone during a mix. And Randall also asked, what is dithering? Well, okay, here's the way it works. If you have um, a file that's, let's say, um, 9624, it's 24 bits long, the, if we're trying to put it onto a CD, we don't need 24 bits. It won't fit. CDs are only 16 bits. So... We could just lop those last eight bits off. But what ends up happening is it doesn't sound as good when we do that. And you hear this like in reverb trails. Reverb trails sound gritty. They sound funny. And ends of words and ends of phrases that are and, and fades of mixes sound bad. So what we actually do is add a little bit of noise, believe it or not, when we take it from 16 or eight, uh, 24 to 16 bits. And this little bit of noise smooths everything out and just makes it sound better. So you only want to do this once. You want to do it during mastering. You usually let the mastering engineer do that, and that's it. <clears> then <throat> it'll just sound better. Okay, from Victor, sound field question. Do you have any tricks for moving a sound higher or lower in the sound field, left and right? Simply panning, but front to back is delay. EQ is volume up and down. Oh, okay, I see what you're, where you're going with this. The best thing I can say is look at some MS processors, and there's a bunch of tricks on this. And MS processing will help you do that. The problem with MS processors is it uses phase in order to do its magic. And when you go to mono, sometimes it doesn't sound that good. So you have to use it very discreetly. But yeah, you know, it's funny, Dave Pensato and I have this conversation a lot about how it's easy to get side to side, front to back. It's hard to get up to down. So, uh, well, an another way to think of it is, are all the frequencies there? So, uh, you know, up to down is, does a particular source particular track have 
enough of the low frequencies to make it sound big and full and enough of the high frequencies to give a definition. So you can think of it that way and that, that works pretty good. Sorry. Okay, Joe, I have original three deconstructed hit, hits books. I hear you have some more of these coming out soon. Um, I did a couple more and the publisher has been sitting on them for more than a year. I don't know why, but I'm going to find out on Friday because I have a meeting at NAM with the publisher. So I'll let you know then. Um, I, I've written them and I think they're pretty good. And hopefully they'll be out soon. So anyway, guys, uh, this is a good long program here. Thanks for everything. And one of the things, let's see how many. Okay, we got still have a lot of people here. So what I want to do is actually hit you with this poll here. And the first thing is, let's load this up here. Just tell me what kind of new tricks you'd like to see. I'm always doing new tricks. And for the most part, they're all free. Whenever I offer them to you, uh, you'll find them coming out on the bonus module. So just let me know what you want. I have a whole list of things that people have asked for. And when I have the chance, I do try to do them and I'm trying to get one or two a month out from now on so kind of let me know okay EQ and compression techniques we have so far okay I like that um, instrument tracks instrument tricks vocal tricks okay more vocal tricks yeah okay cool well good um, this is what I need to know so I'll know where to concentrate the next few times sometimes a trick will work on just about everything but the example i use might be just on a vocal or it might be something and and that's what we'll do uh there's a new one about to come out that you'll like and i have it on guitar but it will it's really nice on vocals and um it's a delay trick special delay trick that you're really going to love it's uh, unique. It works all the time. It's a wonderful sound. It makes it sound like reverb. And uh, look for that. It's coming out pretty soon. Okay, everybody. So thanks so much. Um, I appreciate your your input here. I appreciate everything you you've done here. Thanks so much for being part of 101 Mixing Tricks. And Again, you can hear this again. You can find it on the Q&A section of your dashboard. Uh, it should be up in about an hour as, as soon as everything renders. And uh, once again, I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being part of 101, 101 Mixing Tricks. And let me know if you have uh, any other questions. And let me know it, it, how I can help you because I'm always here for you. So thanks very much, everybody.